can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jeff Spambauer of Relevate Health. And Jeff, before I formally introduce you, I want to point out some other episodes people should check out. This is part of the Top Agency series, and Jeff has an incredible journey. And so there's some other ones you can check out. Um, I had one with Kevin Hergen, who's been agency owner since 1995, uh, what the landscape was like then. And Still doing it today and growing um, at Spinatech and Scott Scully, founder of uh, Abstract Marketing Group. They specialize in a lot of like auto. Uh, they do B2B lead generation and they grew. He's done it for the past 28 years and they're growing to over 70 million in revenue. And um, Todd Tasky, uh, he is a second bite podcast and he helps match agencies with private equity. So sometimes they have more on the second bite than they do on the first. And uh, Jeff knows a little bit about private equity, and we're going to talk about that as well. But uh, in more episodes on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for you to launch and run your podcast. We do strategy, accountability, and full execution around a podcast. And, you know, Jeff, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than the profile of the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. And, and guess what? I get to learn from them too. And so does my audience. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Uh, we've been doing it for over a decade, and I always say it's the best thing since sliced bread, so check it out. And today we have Jeff Spambauer, co-founded Healthcare Regional Marketing. Now it's Relevate Health in 2007. Uh, he's led four acquisitions and integrations to really transform from a niche player into the healthcare platform engagement leader in the life sciences industry um, with 200 colleagues supporting 185 brands and 15 hospital and health systems. He's partnered, I mentioned before, Jeff, he partnered with uh, P investor Mountain Gate Capital to grow revenue to 70 million plus. He scaled his company starting with two people, I think in a basement somewhere, um, yep. and growing to 200 people. And his experience, you know, Jeff, what's fascinating is your experience comes from a combined 10 years with Pfizer and Procter and & Gamble. Uh, Jeff helped, and you know he's a humble guy, but I'll say this: uh, he helped drive over a billion dollars in sales with these companies while working with some of the top brands in the market. So, Jeff, thanks for joining me. Hey, it's a thrill to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. So, talk about uh, Relevate Health and what you do. Yeah, so Relevate Health, real simply, we, we're uh, experts in engaging healthcare professionals, so doctors. Um, by using uh, data and you know marketing to create relevant ways to be able to create value for them, and so you know we're you know working with about 1.4 million doctors across the U.S. day in day out, um, supporting the 185 brands you mentioned, and it's really around omni-channel marketing. You know how do we surround sound the doctors with content that they're that's helpful for them in their practice and uh, serving up to them you know at the right time so that they can use that to uh, get the best outcomes for their patients. Everything, it seems like, you know, you have a North Star in your company, and I love to hear how you came to that, but life-changing healthcare engagement really, it seems like it helps drive decisions, um, maybe people and services. How did you come to that succinct piece? Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, even though we're marketers, it took a while to really figure that out. And so, you know, one of the things that helped me was I read a book by Patrick Lencioni called The Advantage. And, you know, coming from P&G and Pfizer, where, where we had these really great, you know, visions and purposes, but they're really long. The, the whole idea of The Advantage was if you can create a succinct way to kind of explain your vision, your purpose and your values, uh, it creates clarity in your organization and clarity drives a better culture. Uh, and then a better culture drives this huge advantage for you as an organization. And so, you know, kind of giving you the, you know, back in when we started HRM, 
you know, our, our purpose was, you know, grow the business. Like we didn't have a lot of, you know, fancy, you know, kind of thinking around that it was really this idea of, you know, we, we, we can help brands, you know, market better through data and analytics um, to get their message to the, you know, to the market in a relevant way. And, you know, we did that and we had a lot of success. We started off the company, grew it to about 15 million in the first four years. And we're like, hey, this is great. We should have started this a long time ago. Uh, and then uh, 20, 2012 hit and we went, we took it from 15 down to six. Um, and doing that was really painful. Um, and, you know, it was hard and it was really hard on our culture. And I, I didn't realize how important, important culture was until after I went through that experience, um, read the advantage. And it was like, hey, we really, you know, we need to do something different here to really have a very clear vision, purpose and values. Um, and then so ever since 2012, we've been working really hard at, at doing that. And with, with the different acquisitions, we, we've kind of tweaked it. Um, but, you know, our vision, you know, and a vision is something you're aspiring to, you never reach is to, you know, all, uh, every communication is relevant, um, which really ties back to relevant health. And uh, this purpose of life-changing healthcare engagement, you know, th that gets me excited to come to work every day if I'm helping people, you know, leverage, you know, use my skills in a way to really serve people and help them uh, be able to do something that's impacting in lives in a positive way. Um, and then we have core values, four core values right now. It's, it's called our PACT, P-A-C-T. It stands for Pioneering, Accountable, Caring, and Transparent. And so those values kind of really give us this, this clarity in the organization on when we hire people, if we have to fire somebody, when we do reviews uh, every month at our town halls, you know, we recognize people based on their core uh, uh, is peer recognition, recognition, actually, where peers recognize each other for these values. And so that's kind of how that came together. And, you know, we're continuing to tweak it, you know, all the time. But uh, for the most part, you know, I, I would always start our town halls when I was CEO as hey, let's talk about our vision and purpose. And even though I got tired of talking about it every month, we have people joining every month. I had to keep re you know, reinforcing that to make sure that uh, new people heard it. And quite frankly, you know, some people may not remember it. And so that part of, uh, you know, being, a, being the leader is also being the, you know, chief communication uh, officer, or the chief reminding officer and uh, reminding people kind of why we're here and what we do. But it's great having a purpose that is so, you know, kind of externally focused and really, you know, trying to help people live longer, healthier lives. And that's one of the benefits of being in the healthcare space. We'll, we'll talk about some examples. And Jeff, there's so much to unpack on what you just said. But can you just repeat the core values for a second? And I'd love for you to talk about how do you have peers recognize each other in the company? Yeah, so um, the, the, the core values we call our pact. So kind of our promise to each other. And that's pioneering, accountable, caring, and transparent. Um, and so... That, you know, and we define each of those with a few words to kind of explain what they are. And there's different ways to be able to kind of live those values. Um, but one of the things we do in the, internally is we're transparent. I'm a big believer and I've learned this through the, my journey. You know, if you and I have similar data, we're probably going to make a very similar decision. And if I'm making a decision um, and you don't understand why I'm making it, that means there's a big gap in data. And so we've been really clear about trying to be transparent. So it, we have a you know, every every four to six weeks, we'll have a town hall and the town hall invites everybody to the company to come and we record it for people who have client meetings. Um, and, and prior to the town hall, um, our leader in HR reaches out to everybody and says, hey, we'd like to get peer nominations for people who are living the, the pact. Um, and so people can submit into HR different you know, ways that, you know, Jeremy or other colleagues have lived, you know, a value by, you know, somebody who you know, went the extra mile in caring for a client or somebody who, you know, made a mistake, but then owned it and fixed it and they're accountable or someone who tried something new for a client or, or internal and were pioneering. Um, and so that those are all examples that happened the last 20, 25 minutes of our town hall. And quite frankly, it's probably the best part of our town hall. I know our people like it the most because you're recognizing each other. Um, and it means a lot when it comes from a peer versus from a, a, a manager or a leader in the organization. And so, you know, I, I, I did that as well. And I, I would do that more one on one. Um, but for a lot of people, um, you know, being able to recognize each other just creates this caring culture where we're paying attention and saying thank you. And, you know, you never see people's smiles bigger than when they're being recognized by a peer for something that they went above and beyond on. I'd love to hear, you know, um, mistakes or we'll call it learnings, right? And you mentioned, I know in your journey, and you just mentioned going from 15 million to 6 million, 
Yes. And one of those learnings is a customer concentration thing. But um, talk about some of the learnings um, that, you know, we could start with that one. Yeah, that that one was a really hard one because we uh, had a client who, um, you know, they didn't hire us the first two years when my, my, you know, co-founder and I started the company because we both had left, you know, the company. It was Pfizer. And, um, you know, but once once we, you know, got established and added some value uh, and had kind of a team, you know, um, they they there was a, a internal restructure and they went to a very regional structure and uh, they reached out to us and said, hey, we, we need your help. And it was like, OK, great. Uh, and it was so great. We grew from, you know, basically very little in revenue with them to about 10 million a year of that 15. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, we rationalized it you know, internally like, hey, this is great. When you have a big client, you can really focus on them. You can really go deep. You know their processes. We came from there. We know a lot of people. It was it was really um, a great partnership on working together to be able to really uh, help them grow their business uh, and be able to do it in a way that we were basically an extension of them. And so all that was good. You know, it was, it was a good margin business for us. Um, and we, you know, felt like, hey, this is great because it's you know you don't think about when it's going to end. You just think about as you're growing, hair on fire. How do you get stuff done? You know, how do you hire people? Um, but in 2012, they had a big restructure because one of their big drugs, Lipitor, was going generic, and that's one of the challenges in, in the life science space. Is you only get 17 years with a drug before it goes generic, and usually the first 10 years is you're doing clinical trials. So, um, so it was like a seven year know. span there. Yeah. So they're very, you know, they got to aggressively market to try to make all the money, the billion dollars they invested in a drug back in that short period of time. Um, so, you know, fast forward, to, you know, kind of rewind back to 2012 for us. What happened is, um, you know, they they restructured and we, you know, went, you know, from them probably from 10 down to two with them. And so that was extremely painful. Um, and, you know, if I look in the mirror, it was, you know, my fault that I didn't do a better job diversifying back then. Um, to prepare for the day that they were no longer going to be such a large client. Um, and, you know, the hard part was, you know, or the sad part for me was having to tell, you know, 10 different colleagues, hey, sorry, we're going to have to let you go. And we did all the right things. We, we you know, had a, you know, a training package with um, right management where they can go and get, you know, some career counseling. We gave a severance. You know, we did all the things that kind of fit our caring culture. Um, but there's nothing worse than, you know, knowing that I could have prevented this by, you know, maybe spending less time on focused on that business and more time focused on how do I get new business. Um, and so after we went through that painful experience, and I remember like meeting, you know, people in the conference room with HR, each one one on one, and then going out and getting somebody else and bringing them in. And, you know, at some point, everybody was hiding from me because they didn't want me to come pull them into the you know conference room to have that conversation. So it was really a painful moment. That was really when I kind of, you know, came to the conclusion, like, we can't, you know, this is not a great way to run a business. I mean, that was, you know, my MBA school teaching taught me like, hey, you shouldn't be concentrated. But when you're living it, you can rationalize a lot of things. And so that was, that was a really, um, you know, pivotal moment for us to say, hey, let's rebuild this business, but diversify it. And as we grew up back, we grew up back to about 18 million in 2020. And we, I think we had less. No, nobody was more than ten percent of our business at that point because we just learned a lesson. It's better to say no than put yourself in a position where you're going to have to deal with all this, all these challenges later. Um, and that was, uh, you know, a lesson that you know was pretty painful from a culture and from a people perspective. So one is really diversification of yeah. customer revenue. Are there any other big ones that stick out from your? Well, I- I think the the whole culture thing, right? Because going through that, you know, probably the you know the biggest thing was culture because you know it probably took a year, two years, maybe three years for people to trust me again internally. Because you know that's where I started becoming much more transparent. It's like, hey, if you had the same data I had on what's going on, you would also probably make a similar decision. As hard as it is to be, and you know, part of my job as a leader is you know you have to trust me to make the hard decisions because. If I don't make the hard decisions and put us out of business, that doesn't help anybody in the organization. And so that was a big learning is, you know, that's where I kind of got connected with the advantage, my Patrick Lencioni, and really started thinking about how do we build a culture that's uh, a competitive advantage for us versus something that's, um, you know, people just show up, do their job and go home and don't have a lot of, um, you know, care for the business, care for our clients. They just, they're just kind of punching the card. Um, And that was that was probably the biggest learning that I've spent the last you know ten years really 
working on to build a culture that we have now, which, you know, I'm very proud of. And, and uh, you know, we tend to, we're, we're attracting really, really, really strong people because of our culture. Yeah. So I want to talk about building culture. But yeah, um, it's funny you say that, Jeff. You know, I need to check out that book, Patrick Lencioni's book, Advantage. I remember the death by meeting yeah. book, and I could still remember the cover. What I love about his books is they're short. Yeah, parables. They're really informative. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, I think there's five dysfunctions of a CEO uh, one. So I'll have to check out Advantage. From yeah, that's, building, that's a great one. Building a culture. What are some things that people listening that you've done um, that people can learn from? Yeah, you know, like one of the things that was not natural for me um, when I started, I always had this division between professional and personal relationships. Um, and, you know, we ended up, um, there's a, a process called scaling up um, that we yeah, hired. Ron Hernish was on the podcast. Yeah. 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 So we hired one of their coaches. And one of the things they did, you know, is one of the one of the rhythms that we did is we had a weekly management meeting with my my ELT, my executive leadership team. And, and we had to share our personal high and personal lows, uh, in addition to our business high and business lows. And I, you know, I was a, a the way I'm wired, I don't really think about lows. I just kind of think about what's what's ahead and how do I, you know, kind of focus on that. Um, but you know, coming up with personal highs, but also personal lows was really, really kind of new to me. And um, you know, we had talked before this conversation about EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. I'm in a forum here in Cincinnati, and it's been great for me because one of the things we we've worked on is personal growth, and we we use a program, we we use a um, a kind of a system called Enneagram. I don't know if you've heard of Enneagram, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like a Myers Briggs or a DISC, and it helps you to kind of define who you are and how you are you're, you're wired. Um, and so, luckily, I'd been doing that work prior to hiring this coach uh, who came in and talked about personal highs and personal lows, and and the importance of being vulnerable to your team. Um, and so that was kind of a new thing. But, you know, through that, you know, I would share personal highs, personal lows, business highs, business lows. But then the rest of my leadership team did the same. And the stuff you would just kind of know about, you learn about the person on their personal lows and even personal highs just creates a much deeper relationship, a higher level of trust. Um, that was not, you know, again, that wasn't natural to me because working at PG and Pfizer, you didn't really talk about personal stuff that much. You just kind of did your job. and kind of separated it. And so learning to be kind of a full, kind of a full manager, not just, um, you know, but it goes into the transparency part of culture too. Absolutely. Cause now, you know, like, Hey, someone's got a health issue or someone's in their family sick or, you know, those, are, you know, that all affects how we perform at work, but you don't know why people are, you know, behaving some of those times. On, on, um, and so that just get, gave me a lot more perspective of, Hey, people are people and it's okay to be, have a strong relationship with them. And, you know, quite frankly, part of being, a, you know, caring in our culture isn't about being kind as much as telling people the truth, you know, like, you know, my kids are the first to tell me if, uh, you know, if my outfit doesn't match or something, but that's, you know, you know that's caring, right? Like that's, uh, they, they don't want me to go out and embarrass them, right? Kids you know, are so. brutally honest. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so part of the culture is, you know, there's a book called Crucial Conversations that we introduced a, a few years back to help people to have be able to have the harder conversations coming from a place of love in your heart and caring for people. Um, because that's what we all need in our life for people around us who can tell us the truth and, and be honest. And, you know, like my experience as CEO is sometimes I'm the last guy to hear the truth. Um, and so trying to drive that in my culture takes more than just telling people they have to do it, but really getting to know them. And so that was the the, the personal highs and personal lows was a a new thing for me that I thought was really, really valuable because now I could ask people about their family and I could, you know, cheer them on, you know, if they're trying to do some kind of fitness goal um, or if they have a health issue, we can all surround them and, you know, help them through that, you know, those issues. So that'd be one. And another thing I, I do, I, I did regularly was any new hires, I would meet with them. Um, most of the time now it's on Zoom. Previously, when it was more geographically easy, I would meet them in person. But I always felt like it was important to have a relationship with everybody at the company. And, you know, as we get bigger, it's harder and harder. But that, you know, I, I'd have some welcome to Relevate meetings where there'd be nine or 10 new hires that month there. Um, but still, I you know my my policy is, hey, I've got an open door, open teams. You know, we use Microsoft Teams. Um, so if there's any ideas that you have. <laughs> open Teams, yeah. Like yeah, if anything you guys, any ideas you have or questions, always feel free to reach out. Um, and then the, the other thing that we've done from a culture perspective is we use Office Vibe. And Office Vibe is a, a, a system that will reach out to you, you know, about every 90 days um, to get feedback on 
how the company is doing for you. How do you, uh, how, you know, w- what's working? Where are some issues? And ultimately, it helps us give an, an employee net promoter score. So we know how likely the employee is going to be to recommend relevate to a friend or colleague. Um, and that's really insightful. And, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, feedback's a gift. And as much as I may not want to hear the feedback because it's critical or it's different, um, I've learned, you know, through this, you know, kind of development of myself, like there's some truth to it. And if I can understand what, you know, get some transparency into why they're thinking that, what they're seeing, that's just going to help me be able to be a better leader, but also more importantly, have the company be a better organization um, that meets meets the needs. So those are those are some of the things we do on a regular basis that's really helped us build a, a you know, a a place of transparency, caring, accountability, and, and pioneering in the organization. Love it. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for sharing that. It's super valuable. Also, I second the crucial conversation. I actually had Joseph Grinney on the podcast. Oh, awesome. You can check out that episode with him. It's it's really incredible. Um, the Jeff, you know, I'm really curious how if you can take us through the evolution of the positions that you held at the company and how you had to grow, right? Because yeah. I know you started as two people, you yep. had to sell. And then you, when you look at it, I don't know if it's I've made it moment, but when you look at it as someone's chairman of the board, it's like, that's to me, when I look at it, you know, there's no way, there's no I've made it moment necessarily, but I see that as pretty amazing. Oh, well, thank um, you. That means yeah. you're like, you are, you know, not running the business, you are working on the business at all times, and you have all the the pieces in place, maybe not always all, but it's always evolving, but you get my drift. So take us through maybe a quick evolution of salesperson, here's what I needed to grow to the next level, and then each position. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so you're exactly right. As a a co-founder, um, the both of us were out selling. Like that's job number one. Is you gotta you gotta create revenue and create confidence and be able to get people to wanna, you know, write you write you a check, right? And so that was a big part of what we did. And um, you know, the 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 kind of amazing thing in looking back is within the first month, we got hired by three major pharma companies. We got hired by Santa Fe of Venice, um, Santa Fe Now, AstraZeneca. And Johnson and Johnson, and they all liked, you know, my my co-founder Scott Weintraub. We both worked at P and G together. Um, we both worked at Pfizer together, and then we left together to start this company. And they liked our background of kind of having that marketing experience, both in consumer and pharma. That's a um, tough sell. I mean, you know, even the, I know you've talked about this publicly, but even some people at your previous companies, like, yeah, we know you too well. We know you're working out of a basement with two people, so we're not yeah. going to hire you right now. But the Johnson Johnson, these other companies. You know they did right, so, and, and you know funny funny thing we did with our with our you know business address and our card is you know I had my home address but I added Suite 100 and my partner I think added Suite 201 and so look you know at least it gave some level of <laughs> there's something going on and I kind of joke that's the way we you know routed mail in our house to to my office in the basement. Um, but that, you know, gave some level of uh, there's you know these guys you know have some type of uh, yeah you did but Suite 100. In parentheses, basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I left that part out, but just let. But, but um, yeah, the, the, these companies, uh, when they heard kind of our background and what we're trying to do in the industry, which was using data to create more local relevance, it was it, it that you know, and, and part of the advantage we had is we came from the client side, and so we understood all the problems that we dealt with on the client side, and that was kind of part of our inspiration to build a company that was very client focused and helping them solve problem major problems they were dealing with. Um, but yeah, we, we got hired, you know, and so. That was the kind of celebrate and then oh crap moment of how are we gonna do all this work? Um, and so, you know, we Scott Scott lived in Jersey. I lived in Cincinnati. I still live here. And we debated, hey, where do we hire people? Like, should we hire them in New Jersey or should we hire them in Cincinnati? And we came to the conclusion like Cincinnati would be a, a great place to, you know, put the put the company from an HQ perspective and a physical location perspective, primarily because a lot of great marketing talent with PG here in town. We got a number of marketing companies here. And then also the cost of living back then was less than the East Coast. And so we felt like this would be, you know, give us a little bit of an advantage on pricing and be able to do great work for our clients. And so, you know, we decided to do it here, which then created a kind of a whole, you know, new layer of work for me. In addition to selling, um, now I got to help, you know, kind of operate and manage people, um, find an office, you know, run the office, you know, do all the stuff that every entrepreneur gets to do. 
Um, and Scott spent most of his time selling and I spent most of my, you know, I'd say probably two thirds of my time kind of overseeing and running. Um, and so I moved into kind of the, you know, head of client service at that point um, was kind of the next role and, uh, you know, really focused on building out the team. And then, um, you know, one of the things, you know, a- as we grew, um, you know, Scott and I were so hair on fire being able to get the work done and, and grow the business. You know, we grew from, again, zero to 15 in the first four years. Like one of the things we were really struggling with was like, how do, how do we like find all the right people, get all the work? And so um, I met another guy here in Cincinnati who had great background in um, you know, kind of, you know, building companies. And so we brought him on as a partner and he he took the role as CEO for the for, at that point. Um, because he had great experience and, uh, you know, kind of looked at him as a mentor and he helped, helped me develop. And, you know, luckily, you know, I give him some of the, you know, credit for me still having hair because, uh, he helped me put some of the fires out with, uh, how I was wired. Um, and, and as part of the wiring, you know, EO was really helpful because of the whole Enneagram. Um, I'm a three on the Enneagram. There's nine types and the three is an achiever. And one of the strengths of achievers, I can get a lot of stuff done. Uh, one of the downsides is I turn everything into a task just naturally. It turns into a task. I know how to do it. And so part of that journey we talked about earlier about the personal side of relationships, I really had to I, I really had to slow down and give some be much more vulnerable for people because I, I learned if everything's perfect about me, no one can relate to me. Um, and so I have to be able to show some of the, you know, parts of Jeff Spanbauer that aren't so shiny and uh, create trust. And so that was part of the journey I went through. Um, of slowing down, you know, learning that there's more than just getting stuff done to be successful. Um, but I, you know, I moved, I kind of led the client service uh, as we grew, you know, from, you know, two people to, you know, I think about 80 in 2012 is about where we were at. Um, and then uh, moved into the president role. Um, no, I'm sorry, the chief operating role was next. And so the chief operating role was kind of, that was when I was hair on fire, just getting stuff done. And that was kind of when I went through that journey of really slowing down to learn how to create relationships and create higher trust. Um, and that that was, you know, that was really important because, you know, as you get into a bigger company and you're able to attract better talent, um, they don't really want to be told what to do all the time. They want to be, you know, they, they and they definitely don't want to be told how to do it, right? Like there's a lot of ways to do things. I, I say there's a hundred ways to do every single thing. And, you know, probably 20 are really bad ideas you know, 60 are good enough ideas and, and 20 are really, you know, great ideas, kind of a bell curve. And so like, that's, you know, one of the things I've had to learn is like, turn off the how, um, how I want to do it and and kind of empower people to do that. So that was part of that journey as COO. And then moving into president um, a few years later, um, as we as we started to scale, uh, that that gave me the opportunity to, um, you know, really kind of learn my strategy skills and and think about really what are we doing as an organization? Um, that makes us different. How do we differentiate ourselves? What do we need to focus on internally? What, where the resources need to go? And then uh, in 2018, my partner at that time, Bill, he retired from CEO, and, and I moved into that role. And uh, and you know, 20, 2018 to 2020 um, were, were really good years. We, we ended up tripling the business um, during that time, which was you know very exciting. And then in 2020, with COVID, um, we we really saw this opportunity. You know, part of our our DNA is this idea that healthcare is local, and the way healthcare you know operates in Cincinnati is a lot different than Chicago, and so that's why our whole relevance and data driven model works so well. Um, and so, part of COVID is you saw this whole idea that healthcare is local be on steroids. Like everybody realized healthcare is local. Everybody was going to John Hopkins website to see in their zip code how much you know coronavirus was happening at that time. Um, and so we felt like this was a great time to really scale the business. And that's when we reached out and, and looked for a partner and, and found Mountain Gate. And uh, since then, we've, we've grown it from 20 million to, to 70 million uh, in the last two and a half years through acquisitions and organic growth. Um, and part of, you know, moving from this niche player to really now the, you know, one of the key, you know, companies in the space of, of engaging HCPs, healthcare professionals. Um, has been a really great, you know, opportunity. And, you know, and part of that, you know, as, as uh, you know, as you can imagine, the amount of uh, skills and work and um, stress of growing the company and transforming the company and like that, you know, part of the, the you know, part, part of that is learning, you know, how to also bring in additional, you know, I call them MLB players, like, you know, I, I'm a baseball guy. So I, you know, we were back in, you know, single A ball, probably the first few years, and we moved to double A ball. 
you know, the last, you know, few years have been in AAA and now we're hitting the major leagues. And so it's been really awesome being able to bring in major league players in our space and be able to attract them and bring them in. We hired a new CEO and uh, he's, he's been awesome. We've hired a few other really great players along the way, like a COO, a chief revenue officer, a chief strategy officer. Um, we just hired a chief business officer. And so it's been been really awesome being able to bring those people on board and, and continue to steward the business. Um, but my role now has changed more from, you know, overseeing the strategy and, and, and operations to now more um, focused on our, our future uh, and through acquisitions. And uh, really, as you mentioned at the very beginning, working on the business and coaching and empowering and uh, also, you know, sharing, you know, sharing uh, history and, and continuity with uh, with the new team. So it's definitely been a, you know, a dream come true as far as where we started, you know, where I've started, where I, you know, have come to. But again, I'm a, I'm a very forward looking guy. So I don't spend a lot of time like, you know, pinching myself saying, I can't believe this has all happened. But at the same time, I'm very grateful for the journey and, you know, and very, you know, pleased and, you know, it's exceeded my expectations by, by, a, 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 by a lot, just based on where we are at today. Yeah. So Jeff, I have one last question. First of all, thank you. Thanks yes. for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your journey. Um, I want to encourage people to check out relevatehealth.com uh, to learn more, and we'll link it up in the notes um, because there's so much more to dig into. You know, maybe there's a second episode at, at some point because, like, you know, you can't just drop we tripled our business, and I can't dig into that for yeah, the next sure. 20 minutes <laughs> about acquisitions and hiring and leadership. Um, but maybe that's for another time. Uh, but I would love to hear um, because the purpose goes back to um engagement and and helping people right and so yep. i love for you to talk about um a radio campaign yeah sure i mean one of the favorite things that i love to talk about in our company is just the impact we're having on actual patients and helping them live a longer healthier lives and being you know being a step removed from that sometimes you don't get to hear it but one of my favorite um you know stories that we we got back from a doctor is we did a radio campaign for breast ca cancer awareness. And one of, the, one of the areas with breast cancer is if you had it, there are some drugs that you need to stay on for five years before you're really cancer free. And so we partnered with doctors um, across the U.S., um, you know, kind of making locally relevant, you know, radio campaigns. And some of the doctors we partnered with were in, in Dallas. And, you know, they talked about they got on the radio and said, you know, it only takes a few seconds to learn more about the importance of staying on your medicine, a few seconds that can save your life. Um, some some uh, guy heard that in Dallas, heard the doctor who was his wife's doctor on the radio, and that broke through the clutter because it was very relevant to him. Heard what you know what he had to say. He goes home and talks to his wife about it. His wife's like, "No, I quit taking that medicine." You know, after about two years, and he's like, "Well, I heard on the radio it's supposed to take five years before you should stop taking it." So they went back to the doctor, had a conversation with the doctor, got she got back on her medicine and she stayed cancer free. Um, and so that was just, you know, kind of a huge, not just, you know, validation of what we were doing, but it just, it just makes you feel really good that you're helping people out there that you don't know about. But hearing stories about, you know, a woman miss, you know, kind of forgetting or, or you know, stopping the medicine, going back, getting it, you know, getting it back on because of a campaign we put together. That just that that's the kind of stuff that you know you know makes you feel really good about coming to work every day. I love it. First of all, <clears throat> Jeff, I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, check out relevatehealth.com. You can see it on the screen if you're watching the video and check out more episodes of the podcast. And Jeff, everyone else, thank you so much. Jeremy, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 